what kind of form tools do you use for your research? So pro form, racing post ratings, time form, anything along those lines, or do you do your own figures? No, I just use uh, irishracing.com for the, for the data, and I look at videos on racing TV, that's it. So you're not a speed figure man? I just do my own speed figures. If Now, if it's an odd to 95 in, in Thurless, I'm not doing them. Uh, I'll, I'll happy to go with um, what you're looking at and the profile of the horse first or second time in a handicap and then maybe I'll go and study it but if it's a horse that's 2 from 30 and wins an odd to 95 I'm not going to waste a half an hour studying that race because to me I'm I'm no matter what the far, the speed figures show I'm not going to back that horse the next day if it's as I said 2 from 30 but um, yeah if like at the weekend Gaelic Warrior was brilliant so I did an analysis against uh, what do you call No Meads horse the one the handicap chase go I just Boy, is it? I just boy. Rings a bell. Yeah, so I just boy one of 142 has got a seven pound penalty up to 149. It won over two miles five, and a Gaelic Warrior won over two miles three. Gaelic Warrior carried six pounds more, so I compared one against the other. That's all I'd say. Okay. Were you suitably impressed? Yeah, it, it was. It was a very good performance. Um, obviously, going left-handed mightn't be his cup of tea, but uh, I think he's an exceptional horse and. The jumping to the right, I, I don't mind a horse readjusting and losing a half a length or a length. It's not the end of the world. Um, he's been to Cheltenham twice. He's a little bit keen, a little bit mad, but uh, with madness can come brilliance. And um, yeah, Gaelic Warrior is very good, yeah. He's an unusual profile because we're talking about a Fred Winter horse yeah, who's been... he's only five. He's only five. It seems like he's been around forever. Um, but they don't always go on. He very much seems to be. I, looking at him in the novice chase of the weekend, I almost thought, have they cloned Undeso? Has this is this Undeso two point <laughs> and they've just put him out there under the Gaelic Warrior name? Like it was super impressive. Super impressive. Um, the decision, you know, you look at Gallop and Deschamps when he was a novice. He was amazing first time out in Leopardstown, two miles five, um, and then he went on to almost win the Turners when he came down with the last, right? So people, I remember being on a, <coughs> excuse me, I was on a preview panel with Ruby Walsh just before that and he fancied Gallop and Deschamps against Bob Ollinger. They were nearly joint favourites at the time mm. in the Turners and I said to Ruby, can I ask you a question? It was in front of everybody and I just said, can I ask you one question about Gallop and Deschamps? For him to become a Gold Cup horse next year, he, he goes from the front, etc. and he's very exuberant, a bit like Gaelic Warrior, right? what do you think they'll have to do next year for him to become a Gold Cup winner over three miles too? And he said, we'll have to get him to settle and we'll have to ride him differently. We'll have to get him to sit him behind in fifth or sixth or whatever and then come on a later run. We can't go from the front uh, to win a Gold Cup over 3-2. And I said, okay, thanks. And how they did that to Gallop and the Champ is amazing training. Uh, so Willie Mullins, as usual, 10 out of 10. And they were able to do that and they did that and he won a Gold Cup. For Gaelic Warrior, has Gaelic Warrior the ability to win a Gold Cup? Yes, he has. But they'll have to do the exact same thing next summer and and next autumn. They'll have to somehow get him to relax and to settle and to be able to sit third or fourth. Like the other day, Paul was a passenger. Mm. And the thing is, when you go away from the stands and punch his town down that big hill, that set him alight altogether. And then he was gone. But if he's to become a Gold Cup horse, which he could... Um, he'll have to learn to settle. Otherwise, he'll end up running in a champion chase over two miles or maybe a Ryanair. So that'll be fascinating to watch next year. Yeah, he's the one Willie, well, except with the exception of Fessel Vega, he's the one Willie Mullins novice chaser that it seems blindingly obvious where he's going to go. It's not going to be the Brown Advisory. It's not going to be the Arkle. And it ain't it's the Turners. As much as Patrick Mullins might joke about it on the final four line going for the national chase, it's the Turners. Yeah, I think he's, if... Uh, he's a slightly better chance. Let's say it wasn't the Turner switch, it's 90% chance, hopefully, that it is. I'd say he's a better chance of running the Arkle, definitely, than the Brown Advisory, put it that way. So I think the three miles is out for the minute. Yeah. For certain. And also, if but you that just. That doesn't mean it's out next season, just like Gallopin. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's almost what I was thinking. Sir Deschamp went for the Turners, and Willie didn't want to run. He was determined to go for the then RSA, mm -hmm. uh, but they had first lieutenant. So Michael O'Leary laid down the law and said, no, Mouse's horse gets to go, forced him into the Turners, and I think Willie saw the benefit of that. Yeah, well, you see, you have to look at uh, um, the RSA as it used to be. The Brown Advisory, the three-mile novice chase at Cheltenham, is that it's a it's it's like the Bartlett uh, for novice hurdlers. It's a grueler. Mm. Um, the record of horses coming out of the now Brown Advisory 
isn't amazingly, you know, it's not crash hot. Uh, Monkfish, he's never been the same horse since. Maybe it was because of that race and the hard ground that he ran. The ground that day was reasonably, you know, it was good ground. Um, so if you have a Gold Cup horse, are you possibly better running it in the turners than the um, Brennan Advisory? I'd say you are. Yeah, Kevin did some uh, a massive research to try to disabuse people of this notion, and he was making a fairly convincing case at the time. But I can't help but think about Monkfish, top of the game, and any amount of other horses that either ran well in it, went close in it, won it, and were never quite the same afterwards. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a grueling race, especially up that hill. It's a grade one level. You're going lickety split. It's a tough race, yeah. You're also talking about Gallop on the Champ would have been a young horse in his novice chase here going to Cheltenham. So is Gaelic Warrior. And if you're talking about a... Like it, from yeah, interviewing... In March, yeah. Yeah, from interviewing Patrick yesterday, it seems very, very obvious... Factifile is their horse for the Brown Advisory. Really? Yeah, That's well they'll also have Classical Dream, who was amazing the other day in Thurless. Grange Clare West. Grange Clare West. Um, Classical Dream's jumping was as good um, as you could possibly wish to see, to be honest. Uh, I was I was making a comparison the other day that Gaelic Warrior, in the last 10 years, you know, you're looking at um, Footpad in Navan, Gallop in the Champ, um, Energamine in Gorn Park, etc. But that's the kind of class that that was. But in terms of jumping, Classical Dream was exceptional. Uh, he went long, he went short, he was perfect. So he he has to have a, a chance in a Brown Advisory as well. And they've got another horse called Nick Rocket. It's going to be out this weekend. Yeah, one thing about him is that just go back and look at him winning over hurdles in Nace and his maiden hurdle before he went on to win, going right-handed. Uh, he did jump out to his right um, quite badly in Nace. So just have a look at that, keep it in mind. I haven't mentioned the horse, but I did my absolute best to plant the seed, to inceptionize the seed into Patrick Mullen's mind about the horse that he will ride in the National Hunt Chase. You can listen to the interview and decide for yourself as to who Gavin Lynch may very well have put up for that race at a big price at GavinLynchRacing.com. Yeah. Um, I would think that uh, what Patrick rides in the National Hunt Chase is what people are kind of searching for because he's obviously, no matter what he rides and it'll probably be for Willie, um, there's a strong chance that he'll go off favourite just because of the stable and the history and how well he's done. And um, I'm not sure has Patrick ridden the most winners in the National Hunt Chase. He's either joint leader or else last year he went to the front. He might have went to the front. Well, there was Boston Bob, Gerard de Manil. He had three winners of it? Four? Oh, he's had at least. Um, I can't think of them. I, I won't. You may go in and check your computer there. But anyway... Um, thing is to try and find what Patrick's going to, to ride in the race. And if it if whatever Patrick rides <coughs> uh, will certainly go off south of 3-1 to one anyway. Even if the farm is only okay. But that's half the battle in terms of, again, you're trying to work out where these horses are going to go. So, Willie's not going to know. He's not going to know by the time they get to the Dublin Racing Festival. He might not even know two weeks before Cheltenham. He'll have a fair idea. Yeah, now, uh, the one thing about the National Chase is you have to qualify for it. So you have to win beyond, I think, whatever it is, two miles, seven and 100 yards. Um, so you have to win over three miles. So in this instance, you do have to plan a little bit. You can't run over two and a half, three times and then appear in a national on chase because they won't let you in. So th- there's a little bit of planning. But then again, there's races there in the new year, like the Woodlands Novice Chase, it used to be called, or in Nace. And there's also the 10 up uh, in Navan. So generally a horse might run on one of those two. And this is where the genius of Gordon Elliott kicks in. Because he will target that race a long way out. And then it's a little bit like he already has in mind who his team for the cross country is going to be. Yeah. It might very well be a great multiple grade one winner and conflate <laughs> it. But the fact that he is already saying Favreau de Chambeau for that race, like that's what he did with Galvin. It wasn't him on the day, but it was really, he was the one who put all of that in motion to make that happen. Um, it was very much him with Tiger Roll. It was very much Gordon with Cause of Causes. And he went super close to winning it last year. Or yeah. this year, I should say. Oh, yeah, no, he, he can he can leave a horse off for a few months before Cheltenham and go for the National Chase, yeah, 100%. But the fact that we now know that's his target, that gives us a major advantage. So that 12-1 to 1 that Katie Young put up on Monday's show for Fabio de Chambeau. And you'll have a good jockey on board. Absolutely, yeah, 100%. Um, it's four, by the way, for Patrick Mullins. You were four, right. Four, yeah, I think uh, that's either joint leader or else he's leader on his own. But Patrick is into those things, you know, he's he wants to break all records, and sure, why wouldn't he? <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to remember how many times the late great JT McNamara won the race. I think he was a th- I think he was three. Yeah. That's that's one for the record books. Yeah. I'll tell you what that's for. 
Final Fulham Podcast Christmas Quiz, returning to your <laughs> podcast apps very, very soon. You mentioned Footpad. Given the fact that he's in the same ownership, same colours, same trainer, how much of it a concern is... Because El Fabiola was a brilliant novice chaser last season. Mm-hmm. How much of a concern is it that you now have to step out of open company? And John Bond has done what he did. I don't think it was much of a race, and I think Editor G clearly wasn't right. I don't think Edward Stone needs further these days, but not taking anything away from him. And again, want to come back to him in a minute. Um, but is there a concern for you that we're looking at an even-money favourite for the champion chase who has not won a race in open company yet? Yeah, well, uh, he'll tell the horse will tell you that he hasn't run him one yet, so he hasn't done nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> if he could talk. Um, John Bon has gone and done it. Uh, the chance are El Fabiolo is going to go and win the Hilly Way, and then he'll go on to Leprosome. Um Obviously, the, the record is, is one all, but one is over hurdles, which El Fabiolo had very little experience at that stage, and things didn't go right from that day around the third last. But uh, the Arca last year... I looked at it last week. Uh, they both made a few mistakes here and there, little bits of mistakes in the Arkell. John Bond was much better. People might say that Nico de Boinville, who I think is an excellent jockey, made a slight difference uh, than Aidan Coleman, but time will tell. I'm sure Aidan will get back on board. Um, for El Fab- If El Fabiola jumps, m- my summary will be, if El Fabiola jumps as well as John Bond on the day, he'll beat him because he's got a slightly better engine. But then again... El Fabiolo, his first time over fences in Ferrius, he jumped poorly. Um, then he, he jumped okay in Leprosome, one or two mistakes. Again, one or two mistakes in um, in Cheltenham. So he can make the odd mistake, but he'll have to make a few, and John Bond to jump brilliant. Uh, it'll be a brilliant race. There won't be much in it, but it'll come down to El Fabiolo's jumping. Yeah, I love big opinions, and like I was very impressed by what John Bond did. I said on the show, that's the first time I saw John Bonner went, oh, you can win a champion chase. Because mm-hmm. after the Shelton Festival... Um, Especially after Warwick. <laughs> Before that. <laughs> yeah, theory me. But uh, like bef- after the Shelton Festival, reviewing it with Barry Cole and Dennis O'Regan and the team, um, I was putting John Bonner up for the Ryanair and was just dismissive of the idea that he could run in the champion chase. And it's a great game of opinions because you were telling me you were absolutely adamant he would go for the champion chase this season. I just thought he would because I think trainers... As we were saying earlier, people get emotive. Trainers can be emotive. I'd say Willie can't wait to run Fasel Vega against Marine National again because he, he, it's his horse. He'll think that he can beat him. Do you know what I mean? Even though he's got three lengths to make up or whatever it was in the Supreme. And I think Nicky probably thinks the same about John Bond. He thinks things didn't go right in the Arkell. Uh, and he thinks if his horse is bombing, he thinks he's got a good chance. And uh, as well as that, I don't know if JP has ever won the champion chase. No, he hasn't. Um, so I'd say it's a race that he would absolutely love to win. Um, he bought an aging flagship Ruver Ellis back in the day and he beat Moscow Flyer in the Punchestown Champion Chase but the idea was have a have yeah. another bullet to fire in the Champion Chase well, I didn't. imagine JP has won everything else Gold Cups uh, Ryanair Stairs Hurdles etc etc so um, he's I bought a lot of JP's horses tend to be stamina laden or at least they would have a mix of speed and stamina he's bought an awful lot of very fast Okay. Precocious two mile novice hurdle types, but seemingly with a view to win an Arkle and then a champion chase. Perhaps he has, yeah. So uh, I know John Bond will definitely go for the champion chase. Um I'd say he'd a slightly harder race in Cheltenham recently in the slower chase than people think. Yeah, this is a point Katie Young made on the show in the review, and I'll be honest, it uh, totally her work. I hadn't thought of it at all. The more I think about it and the more I watch back that race, you're both right. He did. Now he might get away with it in, in the Tingle Creek because it's not going to be a great race. But Captain Guinness was good at Nace. He was good at uh, Navin. Navin, apologies. Uh, you're all right. Two ends, I would go for the wrong <laughs> one. <laughs> um, you're closer to Navin here <laughs> um, today. Um, yeah, and one thing about the celebration chase at the end of April in Sandin was that it was only just under four lengths between Captain Guinness and John Bond. When, y- when you think back to it, you think, gosh, there was ten lengths in it, but there wasn't. Mm. Um, Captain Guinness and Navin, um, I... Don't. I wouldn't get too excited about the form because all you can go by, don't worry about um, Dice Art Dynamo, but um, what do you call Gordon's horse that was second? Riviere de Riviere Tell, de right? Tell. Uh, She was slow and jumped to her right in Navin. Just go and look at her at every fence. She was actually slowing down and going to the right. Last year, was only a length and a half between them. This year, I think there was, was it seven, eight, nine lengths. So Captain Guinness was super. Uh, jumped brilliant. Travelled great. He'll run a cracker in, in the Tingle Creek, but he just won't beat John Bond. He'll Presumably finished second. I could see it being three or four lengths again. But yeah, John Bond had a tough enough race in the slower chase, I would have thought. Yeah, I thought so. I have fancy Captain Guinness now for the turn around. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, he's but kind I'll tell of. Tell you what we'll do. We'll have an even tenor. <laughs> Done. Gamble responsibly, kids. <laughs> I, I, I just backed John Bonnet Evans to to win the. Thing oh the... crap! Oh, that's how bad I am at this. I'm letting Jeez. you away with a tenner. Jeez, dearie <laughs> I, me! I, I could have stung you for a hundred quid there, so. Oh yeah, and I'd have done it too. I'd have been all bravado. <laughs> yeah, tell, let's go. I tell you what I'll do. Right, I'll give you all the runners in the, in the Tingle Creek except John Bon. So I'm being extra nice. Oh, all <laughs> right. Still be back in uh, John Bonnet uh, even. All all the runners in the Tingle <laughs> Creek is uh, yeah. We've got a handicap winner in Boot Hill. Yeah. Good luck with that one, Kennedy. Um, <laughs> Hado de Sabo was going well the other day. Look, we're we're clutching at straws there. It's not that division is very very weak. And something's going to have to two finish. super horses in it, and then the rest are just definitely a grade below it. Uh, will Captain Guinness ever win a grade one? He'd want to avoid. He will win one if he avoids John Bond and El Fabiolo. Does anything appeal to you of the the horses that are, are currently priced up for the champion chase? Like one of... To be placed? Yeah, like Blue Lord ran well enough the other day. If, like we really are reaching... Ah, yeah, no, you're you're, you're old, your old friend Something Fernie Hollow, your old, uh, my old friend Gentleman to me. I don't know. Jesus, sorry, Motley Crue, isn't it? Yeah, gentleman to me has some ability as he showed last year at the DRF, but he needs nice ground, etc. And he's a bit mad. Um, he's madder than Gaelic Warrior, put it that way. Uh, one thing as well, um, if you back a horse, I was saying this to you at lunchtime, that if you back a horse each way at 33 to 1 and it finishes third and you think, oh, brilliant, I've backed a 6 to 1 winner on stuff, you haven't. Sorry. Yeah. Um, if you have a tenner each way, the fifth of the odds, you get back. 660 plus your tenner, you get back seven, 76 quid for your 20. So you have 156. So you have back an 11 to 4 winner, just to say. So when you're approaching the anti post betting markets, mm. is each way betting completely out for you? No, uh, it's not. But particularly from early February onwards, if it's if it's NRNB, non run or no bet, each way, don't mind it whatsoever. It just depends then on which races and handicaps or not, etc. Now, I wouldn't back each way at the moment because it's anti-post and it's it's November, early December. It's too far out because you don't lose on the double. Mm. If the horse doesn't show up, you've lost twice. So I wouldn't be going each way at the minute, no. Yeah, I suppose the the safety net of the each way is you're, you're in your mindset, you're thinking, oh, it's a 33 to one shot if he finishes second, beating a short head, at least I've got something back. But you don't know if the horse is going to run. You're not getting your money back if he doesn't line up. And if they change at the last, if he gets a stone bruise in the morning, you're screwed. Yeah, I would keep a lot of stats on on um, investments in Cheltenham every year and spreadsheets, and I've kept a track of all that. And at this stage, definitely don't. I I don't any anyway back each way because years ago it didn't work. So there's an an awful lot of content out there. This is something I'm very much aware of uh, and kind of wary of uh, of pushing anti post betting for Cheltenham and. You're very good at it. Johnny Deneen's very good at it, right? There's people out there who have a, a really proven track record of it. I think we've done all right on the final furlong. I think we've we've done okay. Good, good. But the lack of value that is out there, like when you're seeing horses being tipped up at 12 to 1 that have never hit the racetrack yet, you don't know, not even run over hurdles. I'm talking about they have not run in Britain or Ireland. And it's someone spoken very positively about him in a stable tour oh, yeah, like or there was a profile written about I him that says... I it, it, Nicky's horse. Yes. Um, the thing about Nicky is, Nicky is one of the nicest people I've never met. Uh, <laughs> he's He seems a fantastic guy, doesn't he? he Your Nicky impression is better than mine and he is a lovely fellow. He's amazing. He's, uh, so, so <laughs> <laughs> and um, he said, what was the name of the horse? Uh, Jericho to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. But anyway... It's a bad impression. A um, cheeky one for the week. <laughs> Is that a horse or a drink? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, look at, when Nicky talks about a horse, he just loves the horse. And, oh, he's a gorgeous horse. He's a brilliant horse. That's just him being positive. Yeah. Um, so, therefore, when people latch on to that, they think the horse is a superstar. But when you look at the, the Supreme there, the top four in the betting, uh, Mirazur, sorry, um, A Dream to Share, Ballyburn, Mirazur West, Jericho, De Repine, None of them have actually run over hurdles yet. The first one of those four, and it'll be Jericho this Friday, the first one of those to go and absolutely bolt up will be into four or five to one because yeah. they're mad looking for a horse to be a hot favourite in the race. Um, I believe a dream to share may get to run at Christmas, we'll see. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, or January, we'll see. So, uh, But you hear lots of rumours. Um, but I'm just saying, if, if Ballyborn and Mirrors or West came out in the next week or two and bolted up, they'd be four or five to one as well, so... 
uh, the Supreme is one race at the moment that is screaming for something to stick its head in the air. Well, it's very early, and I in the betting, but not in the race. Yeah, <laughs> good shout. Um, I mean, it, it is incredibly early days. I, I get why there's an obsession with trying to figure out who's going to win the Supreme Novice Hurdle because it's the first race. Yeah, it's Cheltenham. Mm. We all want to be able to ha- have keep have something keep us warm for the winter, but. I don't know how good this horse is. Nicky doesn't know how good he is. No. He has an idea. I'd be much more interested in Wilmot. And this is not a tip, by the Wilmot way. Wilmot was very good. Very impressive, yeah, visually. And, and he holds him. Like, for Nicky Henderson to say in the racing post, those racing post table tours, by the way, chef's kiss. They are absolute gold. The amount of work that goes into producing those and the amount of data that they provide. Who I know that your old, your old pal is... Um, Dave does. Dave's uh, Dave's brilliant. Yeah, and Dave's the racing post do an amazing job. His yeah. his um Top his pass. Gordon Elliott and particularly the Willie Mullins one, like there is some gold information there. Yeah, and the great great detail as well, which is crucial. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're fantastic. But, um, uh, particularly when after the Willie Mullins Open Day, unless you were reading what Emma Nagel had done on the video, she produced some great content from that as well. Yeah, absolutely, like, she does. Yeah, there were two journalists who were giving you completely different perspectives of what Willie Mullins was saying about Ballyburn. One was absolutely adamant that he was a Ballymore horse. Yeah. The other was adamant he was a Supreme horse. And Willie hadn't said that at all. <laughs> hadn't said either. No. Yeah, he was kind of saying he could... Emma Nagel threw everyone under the bus. <laughs> she had the proof. She had the receipts. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where he'll end up. We'll see. Um, he looks a very, very good horse. So horse bumper horses can go two, two and a half usually, yeah. So we'll see. But, but even on that, so he's obviously a very exciting horse. Mm. Um, I'm sure it was David I heard David Jennings I heard saying that he was he had been told he was the most exciting bumper horse in Willie's yard for what it's worth that's what I was told uh, and I was told Willie was a little bit heartbroken that Ronnie Bartlett was like no we're not going for the champion bumper we can go to Punchestown but we're not going to Cheltenham for the champion bumper Doesn't didn't want to do it for whatever reason I don't think he's a big fan of the champion bumper um, and that Willie would have loved to have unleashed him there but speaking to Patrick yesterday and speaking to a few other people like the hype is real however that's hype for now. He's a bumper horse. You also so, don't know how he jumps. But look, uh, down like, memory. You, you know what I mean? There's Tully Hill had brilliant form. Second to a dream to share. A pu- just backing up your point. Uh, a dream to share. A punch down in, in, in a grade one bumper last April. And came out the other day and ran terrible. And Bombs out. Yeah, bombs out. Didn't jump particularly well. Jumped a bit to his left. And like he's miles off a Cheltenham winner. Unless they find something that was wrong with the horse. But like back in, you know, Ballyborn or Mirazor West that haven't jumped a hurdle yet. It's probably... It's too early. But if you get it right, well done to you. But look at how many hype horses there are. There's a dream to share. We know what he's done on the track. If he translates that to hurdles, he's going to be serious. I just wouldn't be totally, totally sold on the champion bumper form. Yes, there's been loads of horses winning maiden hurdles, but there are odds on to do that. You wouldn't expect any different. But if you look at um, uh, Captain Teague, you know, he's been disappointing. Yeah, the file has been beat. I know Paul was disappointed with that ride. I thought he was out of pocket there. I didn't think Harry did anything wrong, personally. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I think there's too much blame being put on jockeys all the time. Yeah. Uh, but Harry did nothing wrong that day. Uh, Lecky Watson fell in in 2 mile 7, a uh, maiden hurdle and Thurless. So, I just, while the bumper form has to be very good, I just don't know whether it's top class. But doesn't that prove the point? You've got, uh, you've got the bumper form. So, I would say about a dream to share... Um, I know they hold Factophile in high regard. Mm. And uh, I know the sire, is it Politiket? Um, politi- politi- well, pronunciations, French pronunciations gone completely out the window here. Uh, that sire has been very lucky for J.P. McManus. He's had some nice horses by him. They were very keen to get him from the point-to-points. Now, sometimes those point-to-points can, they can be a little bit, don't know if you know this, Gavin, some point-to-points can be just a tad overpriced. Really? As just, just a tad overpriced every now and again. But they were super keen to acquire him. When he gets beaten by a dream to share, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that JP then goes to the trouble of buying him mm. because they must I have known how good Factor Five is. A dream to share could be lovely. I'd say he'd win. He could win a listed race in the flat over a mile and a half or a mile and six. You know, he's loads about. Yeah, um, but also, you know, given his sire, let's see if he's actually going to be able to jump hurdles. I hope he is because the Kylies are fantastic. But dream to share, Mirzo West, very exciting bumper horse. Ballyburn, obviously hu- hugely exciting. You got Nikki's horse. You got Nikki's two horses. Will not uh, Predators Gold will go up and trip. There's down memory lane. Jesus, we could be here all day talking you about could, this a lot. Yeah, you could also mention Beckett Rock. You could mention, mention Il Atlantique. We uh, haven't even talked about Mystical Power. Slade Steel, etc. So, like, good luck. If you're, if you're having a bet on the Supreme, good luck to you. Yeah, Farron Glory was good in, in Clamel as well. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, 
Yeah, it's, as you say, there's more of a fascination um, about the first couple of races than there is nearly in the rest of the week sometimes in Cheltenham. And on that, so the I would argue some of the John Bond fans, as you were saying earlier on, entrenched in their opinions. Oh, John Bond beat El Fabiolo in a novice hurdle at Aintree, therefore he'll always beat El Fabiolo. That was novice hurdles. As you said, El Fabiolo had, had setbacks in, in the lead-up. He'd been injured in transit on the way to the DRF. He missed the Cheltenham Festival, and the race didn't work out particularly well for him. Also, it's a different code. Mm. And it's the same thing for Marine National and Fasal Vega. Mm-hmm. Yet you're seeing the exact same thing play out again. The Marine National fans are all about how he will always confirm that form over Fasal Vega. And yet Willie Mullins, Willie, insert colourful language, Mullins, <laughs> is determined to go for the Arkle and take him on again. It's almost like he has a score to settle. Yeah, it is. And um, Fasal Vega in Avon for me was good. He wasn't amazing. Uh, he was... Uh, he kind of went on all fours across the first. But overall, his jumping was fine. I mean, you, we're looking for this perfect classical dream round that we saw in the hurlers. It's not going to happen every day of the week. El Fabiolo first time out over fences, we said earlier, in Fairy House, didn't jump well at all. He made four or five mistakes that day. And you were saying to yourself, well, Jesus, he needs to improve a lot to win an Arkle, but he did. Um, Fasal Vegas jumping in Avon was fine. Seven or eight out of ten. Um, no great problem with it. And when they quickened up down the straight, uh, his jumping got better. And then, of course, in the pocket, wasn't uh, knocked about to finish second, so that grabbed a few <coughs> <of> pains. <coughs> is that your uh, lasagna <laughs> at you, is it? <laughs> Not knocked about is a polite way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, no, I like using that knock, knocked about. Yeah. Um, he was given a nice introduction. Now, just to say to you, if, if she'd buried the head off him, he still wouldn't have won the race now. I don't think so either. No. Um, but I, I also think it's being exaggerated that he can beat Fasal Vega. Not saying he can't. But the perception that is being put forward is, mm. oh, if he's put more into the race, he would win. I don't uh, buy into that. It's just, you know, it's t- too much easy talk about that sort of thing. Yeah, Horses that, that don't get knocked about. My brother the horse one time, it's a long, long time ago, trained by Pat Hughes. I'm not sure even if Pat Hughes is still with us, is he? I'm not sure. Sorry, but um, uh, he... Sorry on both fronts, by the way, because yeah. if he's not, he's going to be highly <laughs> insulted. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but... Um, uh, he trained a horse and the horse has been a plot job for ages and ages and he went off favourite for what, what is now, what is it called? It was the Pierce Hurdle, it was the Boyle Sports Hurdle. Oh yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been every Lampard, every it? bookmaker responsive yeah. to that one. And uh, he went off favourite for that and he ran bad. He actually, tr- he, he ran better when he wasn't being knocked about than when he was. So just, I'm saying to you, the horses can look really good in this example, um, but... There's no evidence to say that in the pocket will beat Fasal Vega. Finish behind him in the Supreme. Um, I'd sooner own Fasal Vega. Oh, yeah. 100%. So. Who are you with between the two? No opinion. Between Fasal Vega and Marie and Marie National. No strong opinion. I think, as punters, you're better off not to have too strong an opinion on stuff. You can't have an, a strong opinion on everything. You'd be impossible to live with for a start. Well, you, you can if your name is Nigel Farage and you're on I'm a Celebrity, <laughs> which I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying. Yeah, I'm actually, enjoying I the fact. that with our kids. Yeah, I, I watched it. Uh, I've been watching it. To be honest about it, I've been watching it since it started. Um, but one of the... What, I didn't watch that show for years. Mam got sick in 2018. Watched it with her because it was just something yeah. to take our minds off it. She's sick again, so we, just, we happened to be watching it again. Yeah. But I'm really enjoying the fact that Nigel Farage is not getting picked for these tasks because he's openly said... You know, it's twenty five percent of the airtime if you're picked for these, <laughs> so, and it, people have have cottoned on. Are like, hey, we're not going to give it to you. Yeah, Screw yeah. you. <laughs> maybe he's doing the double bluff. Anyway. Oh, I don't think he's that smart. <laughs> no, maybe I not. don't think he's that clever. But um, yeah, I I wouldn't have a strong opinion whether Fasal Vega beat Marine National. We have to see can Marine National jump first. Well, we also and then we can make more of an assessment. But I don't think you have to have a strong opinion on every horse in every race. Sometimes you can just shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know. Well, it's also pretty foolish to just look at the Arkle market. And again, I think this comes back to we're hardwired in a certain way to react to an anti-post market. So again, looking at the champion chase, there's no lurkers. Well, something has to finish third. We just have to try and figure out who that is. And by the way, that horse that would normally finish third might end up winning it and in some bizarre circumstances. It's a horse race. We Strange things happen. I'm not saying go get stuck into Captain Guinness because... You, you've depressed me with this statistical <laughs> analysis of actually that 20 to 1 shot is really only 9 to 2 uh, but 33 to 1 is 11 to 4 oh jeez but, but 
Marine National, Fasal Vega, yeah, they're, if they get there on the day, if everything goes swimmingly, maybe they are going to be the first and second favourite and they'll fight it out. But who, maybe this Mr. Policeman steps forward. Yeah, I wouldn't be backing him anyway. No, I wouldn't either. And actually, no, no, I thought no, no. Patrick kind of put a bit of a downer no, on things no, on the podcast uh, the other day. I wouldn't be into him. He doesn't even look like a chaser. He doesn't look the biggest and his jumping wasn't good enough and he'd have to improve at least two stone to be... Like the other day, I'd say he ran to maybe... You know, something like 135. If you want to win an arc, you have to get to 160. So he's two stone off that. Yeah, my speed figures now would be like if Nick Morton was to see my speed figures, he'd just cry in embarrassment. He'd be like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, the state of this. I used to read Nick Morton donkeys years ago in the Irish field and legend. Ah, jeez, he had some mad stuff that he used to come up with. He was great. He, he was like, you're talking about uh, Cheltenham, like their St. Perry pass. Sure, we didn't see him last season until December, I think it was. Good shout. Um, so. Willie buys 20, 30, 40 horse from France, for example, never mind the point pointers every year. So, uh, now, the thing about the, the article, that's probably, I'm not talking in this instance, because all those horses we're talking about come from France, they'll be running in the novice hurdles. Uh, all the horses that are going to run in the article, we've seen them. The chances are we've seen them. Yes. Um, there's one horse that might end up in a brown advisory you haven't seen uh, from France uh, called Ile Francais. And uh, he's two from two from at Otay, and he might be going to the Cato Star at Kempton at Christmas. So you mightn't have seen him, but all the other novice chasers you've seen, that's one reason I suppose some people like back in shorties and like the Arkle or the Turners is that there's no, there's not too many lurkers in them. No, Sharjah's 25 to 1. I mean, he's got no chance. I mean, I like Sharjah, but he's got absolutely yeah, no but chance. What is he, 10 turn 11? Yeah. I look at he was good in Galway and he was good in Tipperary. He's going to run in the in the Drinmore this weekend. But Might win it, maybe. Yeah, he'd have a chance. I um, wouldn't be backing him. I'd probably prefer um, Gavin's in it, but the, like a horse like Blood Destiny. But let's be clear about it. Sharjah has a chance. Boom boom. Did you get that joke? I oh, did. Yeah. I'm almost looking for the Badum Tish um, <laughs> sweeper, and Trish didn't act quickly enough, so we'll have to we'll have to leave it out. Um, but like Blood Destiny, there's there's a horse that was held oh, yeah. in. Like Dennis was talking to us on the show about riding against him in that juvenile hurdle down in Cork, and he said it was like taking an under so, and it was he almost reminded me of exactly how Robbie McNamara described uh, taking an under so that he he said he was looking down, looks up, he's there, jumps a fence, looks down, taking care of his own horse, looks up, under so is gone. gone yeah. And Dennis said it was the exact same thing with uh, with Blood Destiny. Now he's yeah, bombed like out in a Triumph Hurdle. He did, but he was very fancied for the Triumph Hurdle. Like in the previous so. coming up to it, there was a lot of talk of Imperia Pass from connections, David Casey, and so on. But there was also a lot of talk about him, uh, Blood Destiny, in the Triumph Hurdle. He just happened to bomb out, but I'd say certainly he could uh, make a shape over a fence. He'll he'll get an allowance up to Christmas, mm. and then he doesn't. Um, you don't get an allowance anymore for being a five-year-old in the Arkell, and that's certainly a negative. It is, but I think that's then significant that they've decided we're going to go novice chasing now. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Um, but the thing is, if you've got a horse like him, what would the point in going hurdling this year? Where is he going to go? What race is he going to go in? He's not a novice. So, mm, true. Uh, maybe they just bit the bullet and went, you know what, we'll go novice chasing. Uh, but I, I'd say he could be a very good chaser, yeah. Yeah. No, again, not saying get stuck into him at twenties. I don't know. But it is just the point that if you if you really sit back and look at these anti post markets, half of these most of these horses are not going to run. This article is looking like it is going to be a pretty small field race. So if yeah, the sure, if the front is, yeah. Like if you took six to one about Fasal Vega, you're basically in clover. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's not six to one now, was he? Three to one best, eleven to four, yeah. And the preparation these horses are going to have. So the way Barry Connell is talking, like he even suggested the other day one run. Well, <laughs> a friend of mine, Peter, says to me the other day, he's only joking, but he goes, I think Fasal Vega will go straight to the Arkley. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was very funny. Do, M- Marie National or Fasal Vega? <laughs> sorry, Marie National. Marie National sorry, geez. I meant to say Marie National. Yeah. He was only joking, but it was quite funny. What the I think he'll go straight there. But the way he's talking. So it went from, I don't want to run him on soft ground to... We'll give him two runs. Uh, we'll run him over Christmas, then the DRF, to now, uh, we might give him one run. Really? Yeah, that's uh, fair confidence, but Barry doesn't like confidence. That's good. But the way he's talking about it, I- irrespective of, it's going to be no more than two prep runs. I know, well, it can't be. Because if you if you have your first run at Christmas, like, 
you can only get two runs, one at Christmas and one at the DRF or around that time, early February and then March. And like, for example, you know, the rule, the, the statement rule that's been brought in for hurdlers, that, you know, apart from the boodles, oh, you stop. have to have four runs. Four runs. So there's absolutely no chance that Willie Mullins will have a horse in a handicap. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, he'll have no chance that he'll have a horse in a handicap that hasn't run yet. He's not getting four runs in between now and March, the yeah. end of February. No chance. Unless the horse has had a couple of runs in France, maybe. But otherwise, Willie ain't got a novice for a handicap. But uh, Tony Keenan's done some fascinating stats on the record of trainers and the prep runs that they have for the Cheltenham Festival. And uh, Basically, Willie Mullins comes out as the GOAT. Like He's capable of doing things that no other trainer is capable of, like winning a major grade one novice hurdle at Cheltenham on the back of one run mm-hmm. and winning a major grade one novice chase on the back of two runs. David Pipe was able to do that and Martin Pipe were able to do it in, in the article back in the day. He nearly won the mayor's novice hurdle on his first run. Yeah, that's a, her first run. that's a great shout as well. You know, so. But the thing I would say there is, like, I, I got Barry Connell badly wrong at Cheltenham. I was convinced Fasel Vega would beat him, and I was, conv- I, again, entrenched in my opinions. I deluded myself into the notion that he was the superior horse and he was going to win the Supreme and couldn't see it. Paul Ferguson tried. Many people tried to point me in Marine National's direction. And Marine no. National hadn't run since the, the Royal Bond. Well, that was the thing that was actually you know sticking I mean? in my like head most of all. And he, he'd won some summer bumpers and won his maiden hurdle in Punchtown, then goes Royal Bond and straight to the Supreme, but obviously he's an exceptional horse. But I think the last horse to do that was Captain CB. Cool. So you're, you're talking about a long time, and, and it, it tends to be that horses need prep runs to be able to go and win at Cheltenham. There's um, the John McConnell horse, Sed- uh, Seddon, who won. He defied uh, a layoff break to be able to win that race at the Cheltenham Festival as well. There's a lot of horse, a lot of those races might very well, we need possibly with modern training techniques to just reevaluate and rethink certain trends and statistics for those races. But we're now talking about a grade one novice chase. And Fasal Vega is going to have had three runs. So he's going for the racing post novice chase. Uh, and then he'll go to the Irish Arkle, yeah. And the Irish Arkle. Marine National is going to have his chasing debut, let's say early January. Well, it might be. A, uh, Maybe it's Christmas. Leprechaun. Could be Leprechaun Christmas. Yeah, okay, and, so uh, he could end up against In the Pocket. Possibly. That'll be interesting. Because uh, In the Pocket is not in the grade one on the 26th of December. Good point. He's not. So In the Pocket might go, maybe it'll go to Limerick for the for the grade one, but it might go for beginner's chase. Don't know. So he's going to have no more than two runs. He'll have two, yeah. Willie can do that. El Fabiolo, I think, only had two before yeah, last year. Yeah, that's, that's the point. Willie's able to do that. Mm. Is Barry Connell able to do ah, that? Ah, look, at it. it comes down to the horse. Barry Connell will get the horse fit. And it's up to them how much sco- how much schooling he does and how well he jumps. If he jumps great, two runs won't be an issue. Mm. But how he jumps, I don't know. He made me look very foolish in March, and he's probably going to make me look very foolish again <laughs> in March 2024. But I'm I'm taking him on. I but don't. Look at your, it, you know, uh, people say that uh, horse racing flat and national hunt is too dominant by too few. So if you get a smaller trainer in terms of numbers, Barry Connell. Training the winner of the Ark on the Supreme, sure, isn't it great? Oh, absolutely. And the advantage we have is we know where he's going. His yes. target is, assuming he gets there... I, he's all the gears in the world, so he, he ain't going to the turners, that's for certain. He yeah. Doesn't. When you're looking at trainers, when you're looking at a, a horse to back anti-post, obviously trainer is key, but which kind of trainer... Like, I'm I'm loving a, a Henry de Bromhead novice chaser... Or Henry, even some of the, some of Henry's novice hurdlers this season look very, very strong. That yeah, they do, yeah. Tubber, who was going to come out at the uh, weekend, looks quite good. Last year and the year before, Henry went through a few blips during the season. Yeah. He went through a few quiet spells. Uh, but it, it seems to me that Gordon and Willie very, very rarely happens. Uh, there was one year in particular that Willie um, had a quiet patch. He had no winner in March until uh, before the Supreme. And he turns out and he won the Supreme and the Arkle, the first two races. Juke de Geneva and maybe Classical Dream or something. That's like, right. Yeah, but before that, he would like two weeks of no winner and people were saying, oh, she's gone, she's in trouble and there must well, be a bug and the next thing he wins the first two races. So, Well, do you remember people were wearing black armbands the first two days at Cheltenham a couple of years ago and then Nichols Canyon and all the rest comes out on the day four or day three of the Cheltenham Festival and he cleaned up. Yeah. Won four races. Yeah, he... he um, was one year Willie's first winner was in the bumper, the last race on the Wednesday and he ended up having, I think, eight r- winners for the... For the for the four days. And the other thing is, there's not much chat about it yet, but to me, one of the greatest achievements in racing is that Willie Mullins this season will break the 100 winners at Cheltenham for his career. That's insane. Like, I think he's at 96 at the minute. I th- I, it's 90 something. I think it's 96. And um, 94, 96. And he'll break the 100. And that deserves a standing ovation at Cheltenham. Well, that's 
that's pretty similar to Aidan O'Brien becoming the leading, the all-time leading trainer in the history of Royal Ascot. Yeah, and is he must be getting close on 100 winners, is he? Oh, he'd be fairly close yeah, to I it. It's, I think, I think but, it's 90. Um, but for Willie to get over um, 100 winners at Cheltenham in March, which he will do, bar a catastrophe, um, as I said to you, I hope that Cheltenham um, get everybody to give him a minute's round of applause because he deserves it. Yeah, because, look, I get it. It's it's easy to just have a pop at these guys and and belittle or bemoan Gordon Elliott's success and Willie Mullen's success and they're say, say they're killing the game and oh, how uh, dare Gordon have 14 runners in Detroit and how dare he run... F- Tell me who the reserve was. Tell me who, well, who he missed he out he on that race. Any horse get in. Exactly. Um, we need to be celebrating this. And we also need to be celebrating not only the fact that Aidan O'Brien is doing what he's doing, is clearly the best trainer in the world, that Willie Mullins is achieving the level of success he's having. Willie Mullins had 13 runners at the 2003 Cheltenham Festival. I think the number is 56 10 years later and 76 in 2023. Mm. Gordon Elliott was a jockey for Martin Pipe at the 2003 Cheltenham Festival. He had, I think, a 10-strong team in 2013, and he had 50-something runners yeah, at amazing. this year's Cheltenham as well. I'm not sure how many uh, winners Gordon has had at the Cheltenham Festival. I don't know the exact number. But he, maybe Nicky might get there if Nicky li- lives a long and healthy life forever. Uh, but I'd imagine Gordon, he could get to the 100 as well. So that'll be interesting. But the thing, mentioning Nicky is, is really interesting because the thing I found fascinating as I went back through the stats of trainers' performance at the Cheltenham Festival over the last 20 years, Nicky Henderson and Paul Nichols, and this is, I am not taking anything away from either of them. They are geniuses, mm-hmm. goated level geniuses, mm-hmm. both of them. They're where they were in 2003. They're having the same number of runners at the Cheltenham Festival in 2023 that they had in 2003. Gordon's come from nowhere and he has over 50 runners at that race. Yeah. Like that has to be celebrated as an incredible achievement. That is, yeah. Absolutely. No, he's a genius trainer. Um, like, uh, you're, I'm older than you, so I remember in the 80s us having no winner or one winner if we were lucky, and all the good horses got sold to England. Um, nowadays, Ireland's not a poor country anymore, and even a lot of foreign owners are basing their horses here because the trainers are so good. But, you know, sh- there's, there's very little between Nicky, Paul, um, Gordon and Willie, yes, they're all brilliant. Why do you think owners are so keen to have their horses in training in Ireland as opposed to the UK now? Uh, I'd say the, r- the record at Cheltenham is one factor. Um also, prize money in Ireland is better. And uh, when it gives them an excuse to come over for the weekend. And the crack is good. Yeah. <laughs> I asked Graham Wiley this question a few years ago. And he said, in his mind initially, he was thinking, well, sure, I can't go to Ireland. I have to be getting a flight and it'll be a complete ball ache. He used much more uh, polite <laughs> language than, than I did just there. Um, and then he flew over to Kulsutton and it took him two and a half hours. And he realised... It would take me two and a half hours to get down to a trainer in southern England. It would take yeah. him four hours yeah. to drive. It was actually easier to get to Willie. And then once he met him, he was blown away by him. I think the the ability of Willie Mullins, Gordon Elliott, Henry de Bromhead, to be able to... because And Gavin Cromwell. And yeah. Gavin Cromwell. The people who buy racehorses tend to be highly successful in life yep. and very successful in whatever their chosen field and is. And the, they're, I'm sure they're demanding. Yes, very much so. So if you, have, fussy. If you have ridden to... If you have ridden, if you have risen to the very best of your specific industry, mm-hmm. you are doing that because you are demanding excellence from everybody around you. Yeah, and you're going to have a, like, no think of Michael O'Leary. Yeah. Michael O'Leary has built whatever you want to say about Ryanair, and I I play the Ryanair game. I think they're brilliant, quite frankly. And there, there you go, Eddie. There's a free commercial for Ryanair on the final furlong. Well, in they get a, to Ryanair. They changed everybody's lives because we all ended up going to Europe a lot more than we could have. Otherwise. Of course, yeah, and. Listen, I was late to the gate. I got the notification the other day saying, because I'll be late for my own funeral. I got a, a notification saying, gate closed. And I almost turned around. Uh, I was at security and went to the gate. No problem. On you go. go ahead. They were super nice. Now, that doesn't always pan out, and that should not have been the case. That was yeah, completely my fault that it was. The is when you see final call and you, you make a dart down to the gate and the plane isn't even there. <laughs> the final call thing is a little bit kind of... That's a nonsense, to be fair. It is. Now. But anyway. Michael Leary has uh, achieved phenomenal success yeah. in his professional life. He is going to... Ex- he's, racing is his distraction, but he's going to expect that level of excellence. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's yeah, not. he's quitting the game. Yeah, he's <laughs> out of the game. He's selling all the horses and he's done, <laughs> except that he's now spending absolute fortunes <laughs> at the point-to-point sales and he has multiple runners in Detroit. Town. Yeah, 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 yeah. But of course, he's out of the game. Um, but if he has... He and anybody else... Uh, who has achieved a, a massive level of success in their 
mm. professional lives. They're going to demand that in the racing game. They demand it, I'd say, when he goes to the restaurant, he demands it. Yeah. Just demands it across the board 24-7. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you're going to be fussy, well, then you need to go to the best. So what I think is hugely impressive about both men, and let's include Henry and Gavin in this as well, they're somehow able to keep all those elite level owners happy. They're somehow able to yeah. balance all those egos. And those owners, if an owner brings a horse to, if, if an owner wants Cheltenham Festival success, mm -hmm. there's the three men you're going to look at first. William Mullins, Gordon Elliott, Henry de Bromhead. Year in, year out, they're in the winner's enclosure at Cheltenham. Well, they're there, they're there so often, you're going to be want to be part of that train. You're successful in life, in your personal, in your professional life. You've got a lot of money. You've got a, if you amassed a vast amount of wealth yeah, that allows you to the spend. You're a couple of hundred quid a month. If they're two and a half a month and somebody else is two grand a month or whatever the figures are, it's not going to, for people that are so wealthy, it's not going to be the, 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 the make or break of it. Exactly. So you want to be able to, you're prepared to go and spend that money on racehorses. They're then giving you success. Well, who are you going to reward with a, a horse and training? Are you going to go back to a, a UK-based trainer? And there are some wonderfully talented trainers in the UK that don't get anywhere near the level of support that they should. And there's another side to that story as well. But they're going to go back to uh, Willie, course, Gordon yeah. and Henry. And like I think, uh, I could be wrong on this, but years and years ago, Gigginstown had horses with maybe 10 trainers and then it came eight and then it became six and then it became four. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the greatest, one of the best things that happened with Willie Mullins was that a Gigginstown left his yard because it meant then that he ended up getting in a lot of new different owners that had five horses each or seven horses each, etc. So it broadened his uh, owner base. So therefore, when he got a phone call in France to say, here's a gorgeous horse for 300 grand, he didn't have, he wasn't just ringing Rich Ritchie in Gigginstown and maybe JP. He was now able to ring seven or eight fellas to say, I'm told this is a horse we should buy. Well, well Graham Wiley, when he was into the racing game, was a regular guest on the final furlong. And he was telling me that the system that Willie had in place wasn't that he was buying one like Rich Ritchie could go and say look maybe Joe Chambers has spotted a horse in France and mm. says to him that we want this one that's fair enough but if they go to the sales they just put the word out right we've bought this horse who wants him and whoever comes first gets him okay and he was, it was there was a sale where he was standing beside Rich Ritchie I think it was get a bird and um, Willie put the word out right we've just acquired this horse who wants him and Graham being polite, said, Rich, do you want to go first? And Rich, being polite, said, well, you go first, Graham. And Graham goes, no, nah, no, nah, you go. And he was kicking himself because he'd missed out on getting Get a Bird, who was favoured for the Supreme, and it didn't really matter in the end. No, because he couldn't go left-handed. Exactly. He jumped out to his right. Yeah, but they couldn't know that at the time. But it just, it seems like there's a very fair system there that Willie has, and clearly a very fair system that Gordon has, because all those owners are constantly coming back to them year in, year out. I fear for British racing, massively so, because... There are some incredibly talented trainers out there, mm -hmm. but for years we've been saying prize money is a big issue in the UK. You've got to sort out the prize money issue. You've, you're not going to have the horses in training if you don't. And every time we would mention that on the final furlong or mention it in any other media outlet or anybody else, Dave Yates, yourself, Lydia Hislop, who've all been highlighting this for a long time, we were all told to shut up, don't be so negative. And you're talking nonsense because it's the prestige of British racing. We've got the best tracks. We've got the best races. That's what people want to win. Now the narrative is, well, sure, how is Britain supposed to compete with Ireland? They've got more prize money. And how are we supposed to compete with the international jurisdictions? The other thing as well is that, what, well, I feel sorry for British trainers, is is that the Irish point-to-point Irish point point scene is almost wrapped up. Yeah. In terms of if the Murphys, I think they are from Wexford, or some of the boys in the north get a really good horse. Sure, I'd say William Gordon know about it even before wins it's point to point. We have a fellow running next Sunday. We think he's top class. Uh, do you want to send somebody up to look at him or whatever? Uh, and they'll say, yeah, sure, just see how he gets on and give me first dibs on Sunday night and we'll have a chat. And you know what I mean? So it's very hard for... Now, fair enough, Nicky gets some of those maybe from JP, but there's, it's very hard for a Paul Nichols or whoever or a, a Dan Skelton to break into the Irish point to point scene and build up the network that you need. The network is already set up for Gordon and Willie, so... And then... Maybe it's the same in France, I don't know. Well, Richard Pugh uh, brilliantly described how the whole Irish point-to-point -point scene really exploded in the wake of foot and mouth disease and how it became so big. He explained that on the final furlong recently. And uh, highly, if you haven't listened to that episode, highly recommend going back and listening to it. Richard is a fascinating guy, brilliant commentator. Uh, and he summed that up really, really well. Also, the BHA wrote a report, I think it was 2018 or 2019, where they said British racing is overly dependent on Irish point-to-pointers. Okay. That's why they're in such like demand. There's no point-to-point -point scene really in England. No, there isn't. It's a very much an amateur 
It's an so, amateur side of things. Like, uh, fair enough, Enner Gamine did win a point to point in England and went on to, went on to be a superstar. But uh, there's very few champions coming from British point to points. I think a hoist in yours is the only other one I can think of. Yeah, probably, yeah. Champion Hurdle Division, finally. Constitution Hill, untouchable? I think so. Uh, Imperial passed brilliant last year. Uh, he'll go to the Hatton's Grace this weekend. Stateman will go to the Irish to the Matheson maybe at Christmas and then Willie will have to run the two of them against each other in the DRF to see which one is the best which one is Paul going to ride and then decide on tactics to see can they come up <laughs> with a plan to beat Constitution Hill which is very unlikely he's an amazing racehorse the fact that he's so calm and so relaxed and so just chilled out I think that's a huge asset that he has if he's going to become the first horse to win four champion hurdles you know it's a long way off but he has the potential to um, he's a joy to watch. It'd be just lovely to see him cross the Irish Sea uh, instead of maybe going to entry that he'll come to Punchstown. I'd love to see it. Uh, it'd be a massive crowd. Nicky always comes over with a few runners, so it'd be it'd be fantastic. I think he stays with Jessica. But um, yeah, Constitution Hill is just an amazing horse. I wonder if Nicky's still a little bit scarred by what happened to Sprinter Sakura. He came over. He, he did. He did that deliberately. He brought Spencer Sacker over to say hello to the Irish fans mm. and pay tribute to them, mm. and it blew up in his face. Did he run in all three festivals? That he doesn't did. work. I would love somebody to do a little uh, thesis on horses that run at Cheltenham, Aintree, and Punchestown. Um, Size and John, for example, never recovered. Yeah, uh, I I'd, I'd say there's an interesting thesis to be done on that one. Well, he he was what Irish Gold Cup, Gold Cup, Punchestown Gold Cup, mm. and then he did win the John Durkin Memorial, but that was it. He was never the same horse after that. Yeah. And Willie was making that point about Gallop on Champ that people don't give Sizing John enough credit. Yes. Um, I do wonder, just because he's such a short price favourite and he's going to be 20 to 1 on at the weekend, that could end up being a walkover, by the way. Uh, Love Envoy will run and maybe she might be second, but um, ah, yeah, no, sure. He, he'll, if he's anywhere near his best, he'll, he'll certainly win. But he's... You know, it's a bit like um, if Ronnie O'Sullivan has beaten somebody 10-2, are you saying that it's uncompetitive or are you saying that he's brilliant? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a very fair point. Personally, I think I'd be looking glass half full that Ronnie O'Sullivan's amazing and if he beats somebody 10-2, I enjoy it. One thing I would say is if he tries that again at the final flight in the champion hurdle, he can't keep getting away with that. No, uh, the thing that, like the two fallers that we had, the two famous fallers in the mayor's hurdle... Any power and um, oh god, that cost me a lot fell. of money. A couple of years later, th- Willie's other mayor fell. Uh, Jesus, bad we can't think of her name. Think of her name in a minute. But uh, I, think Benny, did lo- you? Yeah, Benny, did you? I think that the low sun had a big impact on that. Um, and again, if you look at Constitution Hill, how we got over it last year, it's a miracle. Like, he's literally six inches from capsizing, he's just barely cleared the top of the hurdle. Each time you look at those replays, any power and stuff, there's a, a shadow this side of the hurdle. It's it's a big shadow. So yeah, I just hope that never comes back, never happens again. But well, you mentioned he was lucky to cross it. Yeah, very. You mentioned Nico being on board. I think Nico's won more Grade Ones than any other jockey in the British weighing room. He's a phenomenal jockey. I think he's great. I think he gets a very hard time from punters. Agreed. People giving out about him a lot. I don't see it. Uh, I think he's been amazing. I can't even, I asked somebody the other day, could they um, pick out literally two or three bad rides on the big stage? And they couldn't. Like when it comes to the Cheltenham Festival, there's been a, jockeys like Barry Garrett, he was always amazing under pressure, Ruby, etc. Um, but Nico de Moynville on the big day, geez, I think he's 10 out of 10. Yeah, I have no issue with him, yeah. If you backed Shishkin in the Ryanair, the only reason you had any chance of winning that race is because of the brilliance of Nico de Moynville. Yeah. Anybody else would have given up. Yeah, I'd say that's fair, yeah. Phenomenal oh, jockey. He's, he's, he's top class. What is the one piece of anti-post advice Gavin Lynch would give Final Forum Podcast listeners? Um, do, 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 do. Don't back too many <laughs> is one thing. Like, it's only November. We're still three and a half months away. Like, if you've got 30 or 40 dockets in your pocket, calm down. <laughs> um, Who told you? <laughs> uh, try and, when you back a horse... Try in your own head that you can justify that he's 90%, he or she is 90% sure to go for a certain race. I think that's very, very, very important. You can't. I have a spreadsheet there, and there's a, a different headings in it. Each race, multiples anti-post, multiples NRNB, and then there's a, a file, a, a caption in the bottom called Gonzo. Uh-oh. So 
just oh yeah no and it, there's a certain amount a, a figure that I spend every year in Cheltenham and the figure that ends up in Gonzo is actually amazing that's literally the same figure every year right it's a four percent of what the amount would be uh, it's usually four percent but try and keep Gonzo as small as you can <laughs> um, and by doing by thinking which race uh, the horse is going to go in and giving that a huge amount of thought I think that's really crucial um, and for example we mentioned mares earlier on probably a good place to start because you know where they're going to go yeah um, trainers like Gordon Elliott when he says a target he generally sticks to it with Willie he doesn't really but Willie doesn't have a target somebody will ask him a question at Christmas Willie will he go for the and he'll probably say yeah sure he might yeah and then we all think oh no you said yeah but no he doesn't think that way he's just he's more open minded shall we say well there are two horses that I'd be super confident about turning up in their respective novice chases at Cheltenham for Willie Mullins. Yep. One is Fasel Vega and the other is Gaelic Warrior. Ah, you know, Fasel will go for the... For the um, he'll go for the Arkle unless uh, Marine National beats him in the Irish Arkle easy, which is probably unlikely, but just, mm. just to give a few scenarios for it, yeah. Although the Marine National fans are, are already <laughs> screaming at both <laughs> of us, well, of course he will, of course he... <laughs> and by the way, you might not be wrong, and I will eat humble pie again if, if I have to, and Gaelic Warrior will definitely go Turner's. I hope. Uh, Gaelic. Yeah, I, yeah I, I hope he does. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing, if you're doing multiples, kind of wait until NRNB. Early February is a great time. After the DRF, I think the first half of February is a brilliant time to buy horses for Cheltenham. It's a great shout. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I have too. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed Thanks your so insight. Had great crack with you all and, day. Uh, enjoyed the lunch and the day. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Best of luck with everything. And hopefully we'll get you back on the show before Cheltenham. Please, God. Thanks. Gavin Lynch. Cheers. GavinLynchRacing.com. Yep, check it out. For more information, if you want the absolute gold five-star gravy naps, GavinLynchRacing.com. How many horses have you put up so far? Uh, five. They're all still alive. They're all uh, still there and a little bit shorter. So look at, uh, I'm sure some of them will get injured and get beat in the meantime, but sure, you have to try. Well, there was a word going around on Twitter about a horse who ran in Clonmel a few weeks ago, and people were trying to figure out, why is this horse suddenly being massively gambled on for the Ryanair chase. I had a fair idea why that was happening, because <laughs> a certain man might very well allegedly have put that horse up. Uh, literally moving markets. Uh, look, at, I love Cheltenham. Uh, you know, you can't play golf really over the winter, so um, to have something to get your teeth into every day, um, I think it's Cheltenham is just, we're so lucky that it's once a year. To get the Olympics every year is amazing. There's no four days like it. I love the US Masters, the British Open, a few days of Wimbledon, etc. But I think... In any sport, I think the four days of Cheltenham are the best. We all look forward to the Champions League final, but we're unlikely to actually get our team in it. You can have your team yeah. in Cheltenham. It's like your own little stable of horses. Yeah. Ah, look, it's it's remarkable. It's uh, you know To me, it's way ahead of a Royal Ascot or any of those. Personally, we get to see these horses for like six, seven years sometimes. Start to see them at four or five, and they can race till ten. Uh, you get to know the personalities, their quirks, their jumping, left-handed, right-handed, all this stuff. And um, they definitely have personalities. Every horse does. So, yeah, I think it's we're incredibly lucky to have a thing called the Cheltenham Festival. And people complain that it dominates national hunt racing too much. I have no issue with it. I think it's, like, as soon as a horse, like, you'll see it this weekend at Fairy House. Actually, last, the the the, um, the Hatton's Grace Day provided plenty of winners at Cheltenham last year. So something to keep an eye on. Six. There you go. Peter Rowe said that yesterday in the final front. Okay. So as soon as a horse in the next week or two wins a maiden hurdle or whatever by 10 lengths we're talking about Cheltenham sure isn't it fantastic I love it absolutely love it plus you don't have to wear a penguin suit like you do at Royal Ascot exactly. as much as we love Royal Ascot but thanks Emma. No, really enjoyed it Kevin thank you so so thank much you. thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode 5 star rating on your favourite podcast app would be much appreciated and we're back with more great content very soon look after yourself and each other God bless